I'll be given the topic um, just of um, hyper-personalization and try to answer the question, is this the new force changing air travel experience? My short answer to, to this question is yes. Um, it'd be prompted by behavioral change in both the, the um, corporates and also consumers. Um, hopefully we'll be seeing more customization and perhaps it would be a mixture between um, sort of well-being and sort of hedonistic benefits. Um, I'll try to elaborate a little bit, but firstly, th the first point, um, behavioral change in today's highly digitalized and modular, mo modularized world. Um, and we see two things happening concurrently, and this is speeding up quite rapidly, this is the idea of value co-production and value co-creation. I'll try to explain what, what I mean by this. Um, value co-production essentially um, consumers creating value together with brands. So it's like consumers giving out um, information about um, what they want to see um, from um, the brand or the expectations, the, the product features. And increasingly, um, airline brands or travel brands are, are data mining to, to use these insights to, to improve their product offering and also to improve um, customer um, experience. And some actually coined the term prosumerism. Um, but it, it, it's more than that. I think it's also because um, people want to participate in, in this wide realm of data whereby by, by participating, by giving out data and information, they become part of something that's larger than they could individually be. And that's one of the reasons why I think people are increasingly willing to give out information um, in addition to the benefits they get out of it. So say if we get to understand, um, for example, um, millennials, and we, we see that, for example, they are um, more skeptical, they, they prefer um, um, sharing um, to ownership, um, they are less tolerant, for example, they prefer experience to materialistic goods. Say through data we get to understand all these. So the next question is, how can we actually then um, customize our, our product offerings in order to fit these needs? And as we get better at doing this, we begin to really co-produce um, value offerings that are relevant and that are more valuable to them. And the role that AI is playing um, obviously is increasingly more important. Um, I think partly because these external algorithms are so good at, well, it doesn't have to be really perfect. It only needs to be good enough to convince you that somehow the decisions are better or, or they make less mistakes than you would um, make uh, had you made the judgment yourself. And people would be increasingly willing to give out information and trust these algorithms um, for making decisions for them. And with more data, we get more accurate predictives and more accurate um, decision making as a result. Um, the next point is, is modularization. It's also part of digitalization, whereby everything seems to be coming in bits and pieces. It's very much like your um, smartphone, whereby you would sort of, out of all these different apps, you sort of cherry pick the ones that are relevant to you, and you would sort of ditch the ones that are no longer useful to you. Um, and, and this applies very much to, to travel brands as well. I mean, if you think of a, a full customer journey, um, and the, the airline um, part from point A to point B travel is just one module out of the full customer journey. So the question is, which module would I pick? Which ones would be most relevant to me? Which one would help me create value? And by using that module, obviously, the, the um, traveler would fulfill his purpose, and hence we call this value co-creation. So it could be going on a honeymoon, it could be going on a business trip, it could be actually meeting friends and relatives and so forth. But this is actually a bit more complicated than that because if you think of why would someone choose one model, module over another, there are plenty of reasons one can think of um, and it's complex issue because it involves values of that individual person, the attitude towards a brand, motivation of traveling, self-conception, when, when a consumer brand, what does it say about me, expectations based on previous purchases, um, perceptions um, of that brand, um, obviously trust and loyalty, increasingly technology playing an increasingly important role, 
and of these social media where you get sort of these, these sort of mutual um, understanding of what this, this um, brand stands for and increasingly also today um, ethical consumption uh, whereby we, we are increasingly more conscious about the, the um, social footprints. Um, also, it has to do with um, relevance, so you can create a heat map to see how well your brand actually fits into different kinds of um, psychographic, whether I have a good fit with a certain group or, or it doesn't have any fit at all. The point is, um, instead of just looking at a, a travel brand such as an airline of a, a, as a mode of transport to bring someone from point A to point B, just sort of zoom out of the customer journey and think a little bit about the purpose and ask yourself, how does my brand fit into this particular journey? So with this, you could sort of start thinking of many new ways of actually adding value. You could then think of ancillaries or think of ways in which people will be willing to actually pay extra uh, in order to, to make that trip uh, more fulfilling. So we've came up with several ideas, or experimented with several ideas, one of which is thinking of, for example, um, people who have difficulty traveling, people with physical disabilities. So we thought, okay, why don't we curate um, trips for people to go on ski trips? And we did this actual dual ski trip in, in Hokkaido whereby um, people with physical disabilities could actually ski now. And we had very good feedback, people saying that, oh, I never thought I'd be able to ski anymore. And um, this, this comment I've quoted is it's like, well, it's, it's a wonderful experience, um, really just speeding through the hills and, and the power of the snow in Hokkaido. If you've been to Hokkaido, you know that it's really, really a, a very good experience. It feels really like um, skiing on, on, on whipped cream. And, and, and this um, person says that, well, I never knew it that uh, I'll be able to do this. The question now is it's not uh, whether I can do this or not, it's more about whether I want to do it or not. And by focusing on the purpose and not just on the mode of transport, you get to start really thinking of how can I redefine myself as a brand and how, how can I then create experience that are more relevant. Um, in Japan, we have a shrinking and aging population. I'm, I'm not sure whether the stats are true, but people told me just last week that the number of pets are actually more than the number of children in Japan which is uh, quite a serious issue. So many people are now traveling with pets or, or want to travel with pets. Um, so recently we, we launched a, a sort of um, travel with pet charter. So we have all the seats covered with, with um, protective sheets and, and people are now able to travel with their pets. We have also even created a um, loyalty program for pets so that um, pets can now accumulate mouths. Um, and this was very well received and, and we were able actually to charge a much higher premium than we would otherwise. Um, we, we also, it's not on the slide, but we also last month did, did a um, tour of actually going to regional cities in Japan. It's a day trip and the purpose is just to have local um, sake and local beer. And that again was very well received because the focus was not on um, point A to point B travel, but more on the purpose of the trip. But we be thought, okay, if, if it's about the, the purpose, then it's not just about the customers, it's about us as a brand too, as, as Japan Airlines, what do we endeavor to be? Are we just a mode of transport or do you want to be more than that? So it helps us sort of rethink who we are and also to redefine our purpose, one of which is to really to support the revitalization of regional Japan. So we started um, um, for example, promoting a lot of regional producers um, and use them, for example, in our lounges and in our in-flight meals and also um, um, showcase them on our in-flight magazines. Um, obviously, that also prompted us to do uh, more in terms of um, social and environmental um, impact um, by participating in a lot of CSR activities um, and promoting environment-friendly ways of travel. Um, we also collaborate, for example, with universities to, uh, and give, um, for example, talks on leadership. We, we do the TED Haneda event and we also support athletes. So this gives you a, a, a sense that we, we try to really position ourselves, not merely as, as a mode of transport, but really as, as a corporate with a purpose. So moving on to my second point, um, hyper-personalization, I think it's, it's time for travel brands, especially airlines, to move from personalization to customization. Yes, we have a lot of tools that enable us to, to know who our customers are. We, we know their travel habits, their previous purchase. Uh, we may actually know that person better than that person knows himself or herself. 
But the problem is, um, yeah, given all this knowledge and, and understanding of who you are, uh, we are still very, very poor when it comes to actually customizing their needs. Um, in short, we still don't have this wide repertoire of, of um, products and offerings that would enable us to really allow them to say that, okay, I'm going to pick up these bits and pieces and combine this and create a product that's relevant to me. We, start, we are still not there yet, but um, the industry body, for example, IART is working towards um, creating platforms, um, technological platforms like the NDC that would enable in, um, brands to more, behave more like retailers and to really improve on the merchandising um, capabilities. So again, it's no longer just a product. We, we uh, should think of ourselves as a, a travel platform that would facilitate people when they travel and focus more on, on what functionalities a, a platform should provide um, and start building or actually what it's possible to build everything in-house to really think of how can we source the capabilities we need in order to build up this ecosystem and, and start providing a, a repertoire of a, a uh, more attractive and relevant offerings. Um, and, and this is one area we start thinking of um, um, CX innovation by looking at the pain points, how can we alleviate these pain points and how can we um, provide new solutions to solving old problems. So recently we started um, um, doing a lot of design thinking. Uh, just last week actually we've opened the, the Jiao Innovation Lab. I've just received the keys. We've um, rented a large warehouse near our head office and we have created a lot of prototypes of checking counters, of um, for example facial recognition and a lot of new things that we're experimenting and hopefully this would generate um, or spark of at least new ideas in, in which we, we think of engaging with our customers and at the same time improving efficiency at workspace. Um, our idea is, is really to tie uh, the, the human element to, to digital um, and obviously um, well, the, all, all these new technologies are in fact enablers, they enable our staff to perform tasks in, in a much more personalised way. So we have for example currently um, or our, our cabin crew are equipped with iPads whereby they have information of all the customers of what happened at the previous touch point, for example, at their lounge or at their reservation so that the cabin crew will be able to follow up using the information they have at the fingertips. Uh, we also very recently started doing um, um, sort of a sign language um, translation using iPad whereby people who have difficulty will be able to use iPads to actually um, communicate um, at, at airports um, when they have difficulties um, communicating. And my third point is, is with um, all this um, personalization, actually very often we are tapping into the human side, the psychological side of our bounded rationality or actually predicting our irrationality. I'll just elaborate. I love this quote from, from Ogilvy saying that people don't think what they feel, they don't say what they think, and they don't do what they say. Um, St. Paul also very famously mentioned that uh, we don't do things that we want to do, and very often we end up doing things that we don't want to do. Um, and it also comes back to, to how we perceive consumer behaviour. Very often we look at the left side, I think of the very rational steps that people take when they make a decision. But in most cases actually, we are very much on the right hand side where it's just all about impulse, us responding emotionally to some, some um, stimulus and then responding to it as, as a result in, in terms of behaviour. I'll just give you a couple of very simple examples. Um, in, in, in travel booking, for example. Um, when, when we do flight search, we are, well, I think basically all heuristics. We would um, have shortcuts. We would create some artificial deadlines like, uh, okay, I'll spend only 30 minutes on the web search and I'll make a decision. I'll say that, okay, I'll go through five websites, make some comparisons and I'll decide. But there's no rational explanation as to saying that you should only spend 30 minutes or just look at five websites. And very often it's also very arbitrary, whereby uh, I just happen to walk by a large, large billboard which says, um, for example, um, San Francisco to Tokyo, um, $2,000, and that sets my benchmark. And anything above that would appear to be expensive, and anything below that would appear to be cheap. And in a logical reason, no, it's very arbitrary. I just happen to walk past that billboard. Um, but somehow we get anchored to that, um, that amount and we make very little adjustments. 
uh, with promotion codes, uh, we have what's called the endowment effect, whereby once we have this, this promo code, it feels like if we're not using it, we're losing something, we're giving up something, so we end up using these promotion codes because we think we own it. Um, when we come to flight booking, there are a lot of framing effects, um, like when you see um, the sort of basic economy, economy plus, economy superior, um, we, we tend to avoid extremes and, and sort of by default pick the middle one, uh, which is quite natural. If you come to think of it, it's not just airline booking. Think of yourself going to a supermarket or to a drugstore, you're going to buy a, a bottle of, of um, probiotics. You would, I think, I would actually avoid the cheapest one, I would avoid the most expensive one, somehow pick the one in the middle range. And that's how um, I think many consumers behave when, when they choose their flight booking as well. Um, and when it comes to, to um, a lot of ancillaries like travel um, disruption insurance, um, again, by default, many people go to, go to purchase it. Um, there are many reasons, but I'll just pick on one um, being um, reference pricing, whereby if I ask you to um, pay, for example, $20 for an insurance, you would most likely say, now I might as well go off and have a, have a good lunch. But if I wrap this together with, with a, a $1,000 ticket, then suddenly it's, it seems to be a lot cheaper because I'm just paying $20 extra to $1,000, which I've paid already. So $20 doesn't seem to be that expensive at all. Um, ancillaries, um, it's, it's a bit like um, mental accounting, um, whereby um, Several things happen concurrently. For example, after I've purchased a ticket, after a month, I have forgotten how much I've paid last month. So it doesn't feel that painful. It's not like I have to pay something now. So when, when you receive these upsell messages, you, you behave kind of differently. Because when you buy a ticket, we, we all reach out to our sort of very parsimonious wallet. We, we bargain for the cheapest price. We, we look for deals that are good. But once you've made a purchase and come 48 hours before your trip, you start thinking, or you start reasoning, or giving yourself a good example. I've had a, a, a very tough month. I did lots of OT, and, and yeah, I deserve something better. So you give yourself reason to sort of upsell and, and buy, for example, premium economy, if not business class. Um, loyalty is just really more about habit and status quo bias. And uh, again, I've mentioned about impulsive buying. It's just more about um, 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 responding to, to um, messages like, oh, um, this deal ends in two hours, or like, um, we only have three seats left, you better act now, or eight people are currently looking at this, this booking. So it, it gives you a reason to, to respond immediately. So what's happening? What's, what's all this talk about? I think it's because we need to understand that there are two things or two sort of um, twin function nature in our thought process. One is automatic, uh, which of course is in one. Uh, it's effortless. We don't have to think much about it. It just responds to um, your emotion. Another part, which is a sort of control process, whereby we reason, we think about it, and, and they battle against each other. The problem is that the, the automatic process evolved in our brains from our um, from our, our very old um, reptilian brain and our mammal brain, which are millions of years old, whereas our reasoning brain is just about 5,000 years old. So um, guess which one wins? Very often it's, 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 it's the, the automatic processes, which account for a lot of irrational behavior that we see. And there are also chemical responses that inhibit you from actually um, reasoning, because when you are, for example, in a fright mode, um, your pulse beat will go faster, you start to perspire, you'll be ready to run. And, and not really give you time to think. And we also have what's called these semantic markers, whereby your body would actually remember bad experiences and, and try to avoid them. Um, so in a nutshell, we are unfortunately not homo economicus. We are homo sapiens, and only 5% of our behavior is conscious and planned, whilst at least 95% is unconscious, unfortunately. <laughs> but this prompts us to think, okay, we see, think that we are in control of all our decisions. Is that really so? Not really, uh, because we, we can't really choose our desires, because if it's there, it's there. And it's very uh, easy to manip manipulate one's desires. And are we susceptible to more framing effects? Very likely. And it's very likely we would make more mistakes as a result. And are personalized recommendations necessarily good for me? Are they truly... Um, 
good for us or are they just purely hedonistic? I'll just give you one example. So we can use AI to, to prompt well-being. We can say that, okay, in a long flight, uh, it's time for you to drink more water, it's time for you to stretch your legs. We can actually use um, clinical data or flight hours um, and, and also um, look at your risk of um, deep rain thrombosis and, and, and give you actually very helpful recommendations. Whereas on the other hand, you can actually also use AI to likewise and personalize messages prompted by a very long haul flight on a very, very tight seat that you would um, you kind of regret afterwards. Um, but the thing is, all, all this is, is all depends on how we design our business rules because artificial intelligence intelligence without consciousness it depends on us on how we actually apply our consciousness when you write our business rules. So um, these are just some of the main themes um, I'd like to share with you. And um, being an airline, um, airline network is always the most important part of the product. So I just end with a very short video clip on uh, our network. And with the 2020 Olympic Games coming up, I hope to see you all in Japan. Thank you very much. I know after uh, two days of great content, a lot of us folks are tired. I wanted to first point out that Akira, you, uh, you, <laughs> you, you flew directly from Japan just for this presentation, is getting on a plane and flying back, is that correct? Yes, um, sorry if I sound like speaking six in the morning, because that's the time it is in Japan now. <laughs> okay. um, yesterday you shared uh, what JAL does um, with your staff and how you train them to observe customers. I wonder if you could share, because that's kind of a piece of data that really is uh, a hallmark of your service, but also often not talked about in terms of employees and the role they play in observing customers. Uh, yes, there, there are many ways we do it. Uh, obviously, we collect a lot of data and we look through the data and see how customers actually behave. But we actually do things in a more manual way as well. We actually go to the airport, spend one afternoon sitting and looking at how people actually um, behave, what their pain points are. Very often, we overlook the, the, the area before they actually arrive at our check-in counters and also what happens after they get off the, the uh, arrival landing gate. We, we would, um, get to understand, like for example, very often they would like to find a shower room, but there are no such facilities available at the airport. So how can we deal with that? Um, a lot of people scramble to to, to get their um, Wi-Fi to the SIM cards. Again, how can we reduce the waiting time? Uh, how can we actually provide the service um, when they are actually on board and, and save time? Uh, many people rushing, for example, to to the um, railway station, uh, why don't we allow people to actually book the railway when they're on the flight using their IFE systems. So just by actually observing how people behave and looking at the pain points and, and, and using these insights to generate solutions and use these solutions to actually create better products uh, would be one way of looking at it. And very often there are a lot of actually new business opportunities out of that as well. Well, in order to Keep everybody yes. I want to okay. keep going. Definitely encourage you to reach out to Akira afterwards. Um, but thank you very much for sharing. Thank you very much.